10 Atari 8-bit Hidden Gem Arcade Clones tested on the Atari 400 Mini coming up next. The Atari 8-bit had a number of good and well-received official ports of arcade classics during its day. But before and after the official games were released, quality clones were produced that in many times were as good or better than the official games, and in some cases were the only releases available when official ports never arrived. Today we're going to look at 10 of these gems and test them on the Atari 400 Mini. We will also go into how to get some of the more problematic of these to run on the new official Atari 8-bit emulation box. So, without Freddy ado, let's get started with an arcade clone that never got an official Atari 400-800 XL or XE port in the 80s or 90s. First up is Access Assassin, a 1983 electronic arts clone of the Atari arcade game Tempest, which never got an official release. Access Assassin adds the necessity to fire back and forth on the geometric structures to the Tempest formula. I set Axis Assassin to work with the 130XE, but it should work with both the 800 or 800XL settings also. Bootscale is a 2022 Inyafuto created clone of Pango that uses his 8-bit toolkit to output games for a variety of systems. I also ran Bootscale with the 130XE settings, but it will also work with the 800XL and possibly the 800. Dueling Droid is a 1984 English software clone of Robotron, which I also set up here to run with the 130XE. It plays pretty well and is a nice alternative to the official version. It will work with 800 and 800XL configurations also. There are already two great conversions of kicks available for the Atari 8-bit and 5200, but Philarep 2, released in 1983 by Analog Magazine, is notable for being one of the better typing arcade games to ever appear in an Atari magazine, and is by Tom Hudson, who is famous for creating 3D Studio Max. Thank <laughs> you. 
Ghost Hunter is a 1981 Arcade Plus release of a very nice Pac-Man clone that came out before Atari was able to release its own for the 8 bits and 2600. Ghost Hunter works with Atari 400 and 800 settings only. I could not find a version of the follow-up Ghost Hunter 2 without graphics glitches. With good official ports of both Centipede and Millipede to choose from, is there room for Mega Legs, a 1982 Megasoft bug blasting clone? I sure think so, as before we had access to the 5200 version of Centipede, this really was the best, most playable conversion for the Atari 8-bit family. The score cut off at the top of the screen is not due to my editing or crap camera work, but the emulator setting the height of the screen too high. We'll explore fixing that in the next game, Pogo Joe. Pogo Joe, a 1983 screenplay release, is my favorite Qbert clone on the Atari 8-bits. It adds to the arcade version with spot-on controls and the ability to jump between sections of platforms. I had to modify the screen height settings a bit to get this to fit properly. Those are set on the same screen that you set the machine type. You will also see that once the game starts, you need to use the on-screen keyboard or a USB keyboard to press the return key. This is accessed by pressing the menu and home buttons at the same time. Princess and Frog is a 1982 Romox Frogger clone, notable for both its difficulty and for being one of the six or seven Atari 8-bit games developed by Ed Freeze, one of the principals responsible for the original Xbox at Microsoft. Serious Software's Repton from 1983 is a Defender clone that employs a unique control system. Your ship can only fly when it's firing, and consequently, can only fire when it's flying. It turns out to be quite a nice little blaster by Dan Thompson, who also coded Hardball and Zone Ranger.
Rock Ball is a 1983 Rockland game that most likely never saw store shelves, even though it was 100% complete and ready for production. Which is a shame because it's quite playable and possibly the best classic era Asteroids game for the Atari 8-bit. One note, I'm still having problems with the CX stick, as the reset button is too easily pressed and I inadvertently reset some of these games while playing. And that's all for this time. Obviously, there are far more than 10. We'll be spending some time digging into them over the next few weeks. I'm also looking for a better way to capture the 400 mini screen, so I apologize if the ugly capture set off alarm bells. Until next time, have fun playing your favorite arcade clones on the machine of your choice in the vertical blank. We were children of the Silicon Revolution, an X generation conscripted to fight the console and home computer wars, a product of an analog 70s childhood. We came of digital age in the 80s, believing we could affect the world eight bits at a time. Armed with joysticks, full stroke keyboards, jolt cola, and MTV haircuts, we proceeded into the vertical blank. There, we stayed up late at night, devising incantations from D&D rulebooks and beginner all purpose symbolic instruction code. Video games were the match and programming was suffused as the infinite possibilities of the digital world exploded into the internet age to come. We are Generation Atari. Into the vertical blank. We are the forgotten generation, a misplaced slice of the 20th century when birth rates were as low as expectations for the future. We lived under the threat of constant nuclear annihilation, playing outside, but always inherently knowing the future was indoors. We are the second half of Generation X. We were some of the first to play video games, to program home computers, and record CDs to cassette mixtapes. Our generation was nourished by New Wave, Imperfect Punk Rock, and John Hughes movies. We built Web 1.0 from the ground up using our childhood 8-bit and 16-bit programming skills. They call us Gen X. We prefer the vertical blank generation, where magic happens between the lines, because that's where we live, love, and thrive. We are Generation Atari. Into the vertical blank. The vertical blank is the space between the last line of the current frame and the first line of the next, where off-screen calculations create a cathode ray tube display. It sits literally between the lines Invisible, yet all seen, in a void where magic occurs that is never seen, only experience. The vertical blank is an omniscient force containing the nuances that make our nostalgia a reality. It's the transcendental location that holds our best memories, biggest joys, greatest fears, and our most terrible losses. You've been warned. You can stop this tape now, turn around, for once you've entered, there may be no escape. All the scan lines have been written. It's time to enter the vertical blank. Into the vertical blank. Next brain calculator. Prepare to write new data. Be blank ending. 